You're listening to Morning Short, the podcast that brings you one great short story every morning. Available on iTunes, SoundCloud, and any podcast app you like. Today's story is Sights from a Steeple by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Before we begin today's story, I want to remind you to visit share.morningshort.com and invite a few of your friends to Morning Short. If 10 friends of yours sign up using your personal invitation link, we'll send you a free Morning Short t-shirt. So start your sharing at share.morningshort.com. And now to the story. So I have climbed high, and my reward is small. Here I stand with wearied knees, earth indeed at a dizzy depth below, but heaven far, far beyond me still. Oh, that I could soar up into the very zenith, where man never breathed, nor eagle never flew, and where the ethereal azure melts away from the eye and appears only a deepened shade of nothingness. And yet I shiver at that cold and solitary thought. What clouds are gathering in the golden west with direful intent against the brightness and the warmth of this summer afternoon? They are ponderous airships, black as death and freighted with the tempest, and at intervals their thunder, the signal guns of that unearthly squadron, rolls distant along the deep of heaven. These nearer heaps of fleecy vapor, methinks I could roll and toss upon them the whole day long, seem scattered here and there for the repose of tired pilgrims through the sky. Perhaps, for who can tell, beautiful spirits are disporting themselves there, and will bless my mortal eye with the brief appearance of their curly locks of golden light, and laughing faces, fair and faint, as the people of a rosy dream. Or where the floating mass so imperfectly obstructs the color of the firmament, a slender foot and fairy limb resting too heavily upon the frail support may be thrust through and suddenly withdrawn, while longing fancy follows them in vain. Yonder again is an airy archipelago where the sunbeams love to linger in their journeyings through space. Every one of those little clouds has been dipped and steeped in radiance, which the slightest pressure might disengage in silvery profusion like water wrung from a sea maid's hair. Bright they are as a young man's visions, and like them would be realized in dullness, obscurity, and tears. I will look on them no more. In three parts of the visible circle whose center is this spire, I discern cultivated fields, villages, white country seats, the waving lines of rivulets, little placid lakes, and here and there a rising ground that would fain be termed a hill. On the fourth side is the sea, stretching away toward a viewless boundary, blue and calm, except where the passing anger of a shadow flits across its surface and is gone. Hitherward a broad inlet penetrates far into the land. On the verge of the harbor formed by its extremity is a town, and over it I am, a watchman, all heeding and unheeded. Oh, that the multitude of chimneys could speak, like those of Madrid, and betray in smoky whispers the secrets of all who since their foundation have assembled at the hearts within. Oh, that the limping devil of Lesage would perch beside me here, and extend his wand over this contiguity of roofs, uncover every chamber, and make me familiar with their inhabitants. The most desirable mode of existence might be that of a spiritualized Paul Pry hovering invisible round man and woman, witnessing their deeds, searching into their hearts, borrowing brightness from their felicity and shade from their sorrow, and retaining no emotion peculiar to himself. But none of these things are possible and if I would know the interior of brick walls or the mystery of human bosoms, I can but guess. Yonder is a fair street extending north and south. 
The stately mansions are placed each on its carpet of verdant grass, and a long flight of steps descends from every door to the pavement. Ornamental trees, the broad-leafed horse-chestnut, the elm so lofty and bending, the graceful but infrequent willow, and others whereof I know not the names, grow thrivingly among brick and stone. The oblique rays of the sun are intercepted by these green citizens and by the houses, so that one side of the street is a shaded and pleasant walk. On its whole extent there is now but a single passenger, advancing from the upper end, and he, unless distance and the medium of a pocket spyglass do him more than justice, is a fine young man of twenty. He saunters slowly forward, slapping his left hand with his folded gloves, bending his eyes upon the pavement, and sometimes raising them to throw a glance before him. Certainly he has a pensive air. Is he in doubt or in debt? Is he, if the question be allowable, in love? Does he strive to be melancholy and gentlemanlike, or is he merely overcome by the heat? But I bid him farewell for the present. The door of one of the houses, an aristocratic edifice with curtains of purple and gold waving from the windows, is now opened, and down the steps come two ladies swinging their parasols and lightly arrayed for a summer ramble. Both are young, both are pretty, but methinks the left-hand lass is the fairer of the twain. And though she be so serious at this moment, I could swear that there is a treasure of gentle fun within her. They stand talking a little while upon the steps, and finally proceed up the street. Meantime, as their faces are now turned from me, I may look elsewhere. Upon that wharf and down the corresponding street is a busy contrast to the quiet scene which I have just noticed. Business evidently has its center there, and many a man is wasting the summer afternoon in labor and anxiety, in losing riches or in gaining them, when he would be wiser to flee away to some pleasant country village, or shaded lake in the forest, or wild and cool sea beach. I see vessels unlading at the wharf, and precious merchandise strewn upon the ground abundantly as at the bottom of the sea, that market whence no goods return, and where there is no captain nor supercargo to render an account of sales. Here the clerks are diligent with their paper and pencils, and sailors ply the block and tackle that hang over the hold, accompanying their toil with cries long drawn and roughly melodious, till the bales and puncheons ascend to upper air. At a little distance a group of gentlemen are assembled round the door of a warehouse. Grave seniors be they, and I would wager, if it were safe in these times, to be responsible for anyone, that the least eminent among them might vie with old Vincenzo, that incomparable trafficker of Pisa. I can even select the wealthiest of the company. It is the elderly personage in somewhat rusty black, with powdered hair, the superfluous whiteness of which is visible upon the cape of his coat. His twenty ships are wafted on some of the many courses by every breeze that blows, and his name, I will venture to say, though I know it not, is a familiar sound among the far-separated merchants of Europe and the Indies. But I bestow too much of my attention in this quarter. On looking again to the long and shady walk, I perceive that the two fair girls have encountered the young man. After a sort of shyness in the recognition, he turns back with them. Moreover, he has sanctioned my taste in regard to his companions by placing himself on the inner side of the pavement, nearest the Venus, to whom I, and acting on a steeple-top the part of Paris on the top of Ida, adjudged the golden apple. In two streets converging at right angles toward my watchtower, I distinguish three different processions. One is a proud array of voluntary soldiers in bright uniform, resembling, from the height whence I look down, the painted veterans that garrison the windows of a toy shop. And yet it stirs my heart. 
their regular advance, their nodding plumes, the sun flash on their bayonets and musket barrels, the roll of their drums ascending past me, and the fife ever and anon piercing through. These things have wakened a warlike fire, peaceful though I be. Close to their rear marches a battalion of schoolboys, ranged in crooked and irregular platoons, shouldering sticks, thumping a harsh and unripe chatter from an instrument of tin, and ridiculously aping the intricate maneuvers of the foremost band. Nevertheless, as slight differences are scarcely perceptible from a church spire, one might be tempted to ask, which are the boys, or rather, which the men? But leaving these, let us turn to the third procession, which, though sadder in outward show, may excite identical reflections in the thoughtful mind. It is a funeral, a hearse drawn by a black and bony steed, covered by a dusty pall, two or three coaches rumbling over the stones, their drivers half asleep, a dozen couple of careless mourners in their everyday attire. Such was not the fashion of our fathers when they carried a friend to his grave. There is now no doleful clang of the bell to proclaim sorrow to the town. Was the king of terrors more awful in those days than in our own, that wisdom and philosophy have been able to produce this change? Not so. Here is a proof that he retains his proper majesty. The military men and the military boys are wheeling round the corner and meet the funeral full in the face. Immediately the drum is silent, all but the tap that regulates each simultaneous footfall. The soldiers yield the path to the dusty hearse and unpretending train, and the children quit their ranks and cluster on the sidewalks with timorous and instinctive curiosity. The mourners enter the churchyard at the base of the steeple and pause by an open grave among the burial stones. The lightning glimmers on them as they lower down the coffin, and the thunder rattles heavily while they throw the earth upon its lid. Verily the shower is near, and I tremble for the young man and the girls who have now disappeared from the long and shady street. How various are the situations of the people covered by the roofs beneath me, and how diversified are the events at this moment befalling them! The newborn, the aged, the dying, the strong in life, and the recent dead are in the chambers of these many mansions. The full of hope, the happy, the miserable, and the desperate dwell together within the circle of my glance. In some of the houses over which my eyes roam so coldly, guilt is entering into hearts that are still tenanted by a debased and trodden virtue. Guilt is on the very edge of commission, and the impending deed might be averted. Guilt is done, and the criminal wonders if it be irrevocable. There are broad thoughts struggling in my mind, and were I able to give them distinctness, they would make their way in eloquence. Lo, the raindrops are descending. The clouds within a little time have gathered over all the sky, hanging heavily as if about to drop in one unbroken mass upon the earth. At intervals the lightning flashes from their brooding hearts, quivers, disappears, and then comes the thunder, traveling slowly after its twin-born flame. A strong wind has sprung up, howls through the darkened streets, and raises the dust in dense bodies to rebel against the approaching storm. The disbanded soldiers fly. The funeral has already vanished like its dead, and all people hurry homeward, all that have a home, while a few lounge by the corners or trudge on desperately at their leisure. In a narrow lane which communicates with the shady street, I discern the rich old merchant putting himself to the top of his speed, lest the rain should convert his hair powder to a paste. Unhappy gentleman! By the slow vehemence and painful moderation wherewith he journeys, it is but too evident that Podagra has left its thrilling tenderness in his great toe. But yonder, at a far more rapid pace, come three other of my acquaintance, the two pretty girls and the young man unseasonably interrupted in their walk. Their footsteps are supported by the risen dust. The wind lends them its velocity. They fly like three seabirds driven landward by the tempestuous breeze. 
The ladies would not thus rival Atalanta if they knew that any one were at leisure to observe them. Ah, as they hasten onward, laughing in the angry face of nature, a sudden catastrophe has chanced. At the corner where the narrow lane enters into the street, they come plump against the old merchant, whose tortoise motion has just brought him to that point. He likes not the sweet encounter. The darkness of the whole air gathers speedily upon his visage, and there is a pause on both sides. Finally, he thrusts aside the youth with little courtesy, seizes an arm of each of the two girls, and plods onward like a magician with a prize of captive fairies. All this is easy to be understood. How disconsolate the poor lover stands, regardless of the rain that threatens an exceeding damage to his well-fashioned habiliments, till he catches a backward glance of mirth from a bright eye, and turns away with whatever comfort it conveys. The old man and his daughters are safely housed, and now the storm lets loose its fury. In every dwelling I perceive the faces of the chambermaids as they shut down the windows, excluding the impetuous shower and shrinking away from the quick fiery glare. The large drops descend with force upon the slated roofs and rise again in smoke. There is a rush and a roar of a river through the air, and muddy streams bubble majestically along the pavement, whirl their dusky foam into the kennel, and disappear beneath iron grates. Thus did Arethusa sink. I love not my station here aloft in the midst of the tumult which I am powerless to direct or quell, with the blue lightning wrinkling on my brow and the tender muttering of its first awful syllables in my ear, I will descend. Yet let me give another glance to the sea, where the foam breaks out in long white lines upon a broad expanse of blackness, or boils up in far distant points like snowy mountain tops in the eddies of a flood. And let me look once more at the green plain and little green hills of the country, over which the giant of the storm is striding in robes of mist and at the town whose obscured and desolate streets might beseem a city of the dead, and turning a single moment to the sky, now gloomy as an author's prospects, I prepare to resume my station on lower earth. But stay! A little speck of azure has widened in the western heavens. The sunbeams find a passage and go rejoicing through the tempest, and on yonder darkest cloud, born like hallowed hopes of the glory of another world, and the trouble and tears of this, brightens forth the rainbow. Thanks for listening to the Morning Short Podcast. I'd like to remind you to rate this episode five stars on iTunes and to visit share.morningshort.com to invite your family and friends to listen to stories from Morning Short. Learn more about the Morning Short Project and sign up for our daily emails at morningshort.com. <laughs>